I've never been as desperately anxious for something to come out as I was in 2012 for Assassin's Creed 3. I would come home every day and immediately go on Google to see if any new footage or info had been released, because as much as I enjoyed Brotherhood and Revelations, I had been waiting on a true sequel to AC2 since 2009. And as far as marketing goes, Ubisoft was doing a good job of building up the hype. You resist. Why? Because no one else will. Yeah, I mean, I couldn't wait. But then it came out, and as you can see by the title of this video, it didn't live up to those admittedly lofty expectations. I defended it at first. My friends would complain about the setting and the protagonist, but I stood by it, having waited so long to experience it. I was just happy to have it, truth be told. But as I kept going, as I found every animal in every region, as I got max level in the multiplayer, as I completed all full sync requirements, I came to terms with the fact that this game fell short not just of my own overblown hype, but also of the standard the previous games had set. While the game's scope and ambition were so impressive at the time and still do shine through today, almost every aspect of the experience felt off. The story was disjointed, the gameplay unpolished, and a lot of aspects of the formula were tweaked in ways that not only failed to innovate, but actively felt like steps backward. I'm going to be discussing how this game let me down, but there's a reason I don't title this video the worst AC game or anything like that. I have talked about Valhalla and Unity before, and I've made it clear that those are the bottom of my own personal list when it comes to this series, and while AC3 isn't exactly high on it, it is a more complete and coherent experience than either of those. But to me, that's just the thing. It's one thing for a game to be irredeemably bad. What makes AC3 so disappointing is that the potential highs were so clearly attainable, only for it to fall short in nearly every category. I want to start this video off with praise in an area where the game really does deserve it, which is the world. Assassin's Creed games always kill it when it comes to building out these historical open worlds, but I know this one is a little more polarizing than the others. The shift from urban hubs with millennia of history to forests and colonial cities that were only a few hundred years old was a big one, and many have criticized it for not playing to the franchise's best strengths. I agree there are parts of the world design that don't hit the mark, but the scale, ambition, and beauty of Assassin's Creed 3 are absolutely high points for me. It's helpful to put AC3 in the context of when it came out. Ezio had just gotten his trilogy, so we had three games in a row with worlds that were pretty similar in size and design. AC3's marketing made it clear that it would dwarf everything that had come before. The Frontier is this big, open wilderness environment that was built to simulate the type of locale many people associate with the era quote-unquote untamed land that could stretch for miles without a man-made structure. The map is diverse, with dreary beaches, rolling hills, dense forests, swampy wetlands, and both colonial and indigenous communities. Crowds of people are one thing, but this game simulates entire ecosystems with such a wide variety of flora and fauna, making the world feel alive in a way that is unlike anything the series had really tried before. People forget now that we have games like Odyssey and Valhalla, but at the time, AC3 felt incredibly large and content-dense. Another reason the inclusion of the Frontier didn't bother me too much is that I still legitimately enjoyed the cities of AC3, and I didn't feel like the core AC experience was lost. Boston and New York are obviously not as big and grand as Rome or Constantinople. These are brick structures that are only a few stories high. There are no hulking cathedrals or thousand-year-old towers to speak of. But personally, I was just as fascinated with these smaller, more modest cities as I was with those in prior games. Almost all of what we see here no longer exists and was recreated using old maps and documents, and I love the settings that let me experience a possible version of a world that is otherwise lost to time. Plus, I do think these cities were dense and lively enough to be just as fun and interesting as places like Florence and Damascus, at least in my taste. A criticism I do have of these cities is that they are pretty much identical in design. They really don't do anything to differentiate the experience of exploring either. AC1 and AC2 had very similar cities, but they did more to give them unique layouts and aesthetics. A huge technical improvement with the world, though, is the weather system. I don't know if I've ever played an open-world game where the dynamic storms felt as visually oppressive as they can in AC3. And similarly, certain segments of the game take place during winter, meaning every area essentially has two versions of its map, one with snow and one without, and that is an awesome amount of effort. A narrative aspect of the setting I really appreciate is that the Animus does not translate anything anymore. Since the characters primarily speak English anyways, the decision was made to have all other languages spoken and subtitled. 
including our main character's native tongue of Ganyan Geha. I haven't seen this language spoken in other mainstream media, and it is part of the game's overall interest in simulating life in the colonies, not just using it as a backdrop. The player can go hours simply observing people of different era-appropriate vocations performing mundane tasks, and there is an incredible attention to detail if you just sit and watch. Beauty and ambition, however, are not all you need to make a game. As with many other AC titles, things start to get a little choppier when you actually start looking at how the game utilizes this world and fills it with content. AC3 was the first game in the series to go in with the philosophy that bigger and more packed maps equated to a better game. Every segment of every zone has a myriad of side missions, random checklists, challenges, and collectibles to complete. Having a lot of content is not a bad thing. It's a beautiful map, might as well put plenty of stuff in it. But so much of this content just feels like filler, forcing you to grind the same areas for items and do the same stuff over and over again. Now I do want to note that a lot of the side content is really cool. After Revelations was so rushed that we just had a fraction of the content that Brotherhood gave us, I appreciate that AC3 had full, meaningful levels and story arcs that are entirely missable. The Captain Kid missions are essentially this game's version of the old tombs. Linear missions that are story-driven and have a level of polish even the main game doesn't regularly attain. Likewise, the naval missions offer a totally separate gameplay experience from the main story that has its own villain and conclusion. These combine for a solid five hours of fully realized content that takes place entirely outside of the open world maps, and they show just how dedicated the team was to giving us as much to do as possible. That being said, the shine on these five hours really showcases just how unpolished the other 20 to 25 hours of side content can be. There's only one word I can think of that accurately describes what it feels like to do the open world activities of AC3, and it is Eurojank. If you look it up, Eurojank is defined as a video game from Europe, specifically Eastern Europe, with ambitious concepts but lacking in execution, sometimes exhibiting unintended glitches. Now, AC3 is not literally a Eurojank game. It's not a small indie title made in some family basement in Poland. It just sure as heck feels like it sometimes. The level of polish in AC3 sometimes feels closer to Thief Simulator or My Summer Car than any AAA game ever should. Unity's horrific launch overshadows the technical issues in other AC games, but when AC3 came out, its immense glitchiness and poor performance were a big part of the discourse. I actually wanted to record all my footage on the original PS3 version since the remaster has some iffy lighting and texture changes, but I was dipping below 20 frames per second with tons of pop-in on a machine I only recently played MGS Ground Zeroes and Infamous 2 on with no issues. And to be fair, most people will play the remaster these days anyway, and this version runs pretty much fine for the most part, but that barely taped together feel of the original is still very much alive. Character models feel uglier than the last couple games with a porcelain doll look to them, and cutscenes feel very amateurish in their presentation, with bizarre close-up shots and incoherent action sequences. Every mission ends with a jarring cut to a result screen where NPCs in the prior cutscene have a tendency to either disappear or T-pose for dominance. This can't be right. It says they plan to murder Washington. Side missions regularly require you to run around in their general area and reload the game a couple times for them to pop up, and on my first ever playthrough in 2012, the one where I was trying so hard to love the game, I got to 99% completion only for a single assassination target not to spawn, making completion impossible. I mentioned how ambitious it was to fill this world with a variety of animal life, but the AI on these things is atrocious. They just run in circles half the time. You can easily just wait for them to turn right into you. The bait and trap system tried to flesh out hunting as a full-on mechanic, but it's honestly easier just to sprint at whatever animal you want to kill. It gets a lot worse with the bigger animals, because then you are subjected to the jankiest quicktime events I have ever seen in a game. Killing these predators looks awful and feels awful. The game falls way short of fulfilling that frontiersman hunter fantasy that it is trying to go for. Then there are the guild missions and the crafting guides. If you want to 100% this game, a pretty large chunk of your time will be spent filling out one of a dozen random checklists that the game subjects you to. In a single corner of the frontier, you might find a list of courier items to grind out, a map of every possible animal to skin, a frontiersman challenge to complete, and a fort to take down, and all that would only get you about 5% completion of the frontier alone, and I don't think a lot of that content is especially fun. The marketing promised that there would be dynamic events occurring in the cities that would happen in the streets that you could intervene in to add to the immersiveness. Follow 
We've also tried very hard to integrate side missions into the narrative, into the players' experience throughout the city. So as you move through Boston or New York or even the frontier, you'll see different characters that uh, offer you the opportunity to help. In the actual game, these are just a bunch of markers pointing you to repetitive tasks. No NPCs organically pointing you anywhere, just another boring, repetitive checklist. Even mission types that worked before are somehow made to be less creative than they were. Since AC2, we had these assassination contracts, where each one had a unique backstory and was placed somewhere that somehow made killing them a mechanical challenge. In AC3, you go up to an NPC and accept a quest with no dialogue or backstory or anything, and then five generic enemies just spawn on the map. It feels like one of those community-created missions where people just use a level editor to paste enemies anywhere haphazardly. Then there are some bits of content that just blow my mind with how useless and unfinished they feel. The underground. What is this supposed to be? These mazes where you are forced to slowly move around undercooked areas with the jankiest platforming in the game and incredibly boring puzzles. And they are required to get all the fast travel points. In a similar vein is the trade system. I mean, what the heck am I even looking at? I mean, it isn't that hard to understand, but it's just so convoluted. Menus upon menus that really make you feel like an 18th century bookkeeper. You don't touch a vast majority of this stuff. You know early on what makes money, so why learn to make dozens of random trinkets to send across the country? In my Unity video, I talked about how all the side content was boring and low effort. And AC3 doesn't fit that same bill. It has missions that totally do show a level of intentionality and creativity. But at the same time, Unity also never came close to the horrendously bad filler content AC3 is stuffed with showcasing a pretty extreme dichotomy in quality within this game. It feels even worse when you compare it to AC4, which was largely being developed at the same time. We really see how much of a creative deficit AC3 was in when it came to fleshing out its world, when you compare it to a game that used primarily the exact same systems, but provided almost exclusively fun side content and much better graphics, camera work, and polish. I want to talk more about how this world is handled, but to do that, I want to start talking about what it feels like to traverse it. So again, I am starting with praise, and here I am going to bring up my absolute favorite part of AC3, the animations. This franchise was once defined by the quality of its animations, and that is one category where AC3 totally upped the ante over its predecessors. Your character runs with such strength and momentum, while also adding some artistic flair beyond Ezio's stiff movements. He automatically pushes himself off small birch trees as you sprint past, and he deftly maneuvers around obstacles where, in any other game, your character would get completely stuck. Way before launch, I remember seeing this V-shaped tree in a trailer and thinking, better not jump on that, you'll glitch right through it or something, but he didn't. He has an animation for it, and that's really cool. I will say the default walk makes you look like you have scoliosis, which is a weird choice given the fact that your playable characters generally have pretty good posture, but other than that, the animation quality in this game is top shelf, and in some ways, still unmatched 12 years later. I honestly think this is a solid iteration that makes some fun improvements and took a few unfortunate steps back. The system looks prettier than the other games while also taking some control away from the player. Now, I understand that most people who play these games just hold buttons and aren't looking for in-depth eject mechanics or anything like that, but I don't really understand why some of this stuff was taken away. It wasn't broken, but they felt a need to fix it. I get that holding two buttons and the stick was cumbersome, but tying sprint and climb together kind of sucks. It is much more common to climb a protruding object you meant to run past than in previous games. Likewise, I see no reason why a dedicated catch ledge button was removed in favor of just using the stick, which is way less consistent. Nor why the eject function was limited so that you had to input it at the start of a wall run as opposed to any point during it. Some stuff is honestly improved, like increased descent abilities, but these negative changes seem so needless, as there is no benefit to this downgrade in player agency. A bigger issue I have with the parkour is in the layout of the environments. I know I said I like the cities, and I do, they really aren't my issue here. What I dislike more is the tree climbing. It's functional and inoffensive, but there was so much opportunity in moving away from the man-made right angles of a city to the seemingly random growth patterns of a forest. I had so many ideas about what this could look like when Tree Traversal was announced. When AC1 came out, I was enamored by the fact that you could have a building where every single protruding object could be grabbed and used to climb, compared to the linear paths in most platformers. I thought AC3 might give us the same type of innovation, but for trees. Unfortunately, it is much more limited. 
Tree climbing in AC3 is essentially a series of relatively short linear paths that begin with a rock or log that sends you up and ends a few trees later when you are deposited back on the ground. While AC1 let you climb every wall of every building, in AC3 you can only climb the trees that the game integrates into its limited linear paths. Each tree only has a couple branches you can interact with, and having more than one tree to jump to at any given time is not the norm. While I pictured being able to ascend to the treetops or descend to the lowest branches before launch, there is no such verticality here. Tree climbing is primarily horizontal. In stark contrast to the creativity allowed by city parkour, tree climbing is almost always about moving in a straight line with no player agency. Discussions on animation cancelling and eject mechanics are useless here, because in the trees you only ever hold forward. There is no more depth than that. It isn't the only wasted opportunity for creativity. One of the only differences between New York and Boston is the fact that a chunk of New York is burned down. You can do anything you want with the non-traditional layout of a burnt down city, and they don't utilize it at all. Instead, navigating this area is jankier and less interesting than climbing other places, so I just walk around. The parkour itself in this game has its ups and downs, and I appreciate the beauty of the animation set. But outside of those fluid animations, almost every mechanic has less depth and precision control than past games, for seemingly no reason other than to change things up. Combine that with the fact that every new challenge AC3 tackled was handled with a fraction of the creative innovation of AC1, and you're left with a system that is fine, but falls way short of its own potential. Just like with Traversal, the combat has incredible animation work, with some of the most fluid and cool-looking finisher kills in the series, looking better overall than AC4 and Rogue in my opinion, despite them having essentially the same combat system. The raw brutality and power here demonstrate that we aren't just playing as a rich kid from Florence anymore, and there are a great variety of animations for your arsenal of weapons. You have more options than in the past for integrating your tools into combat, like your pistols, bow, and rope darts. Enemies also feel a little more aggressive than they have in the past, and you can even have two attack you at once for a cool double finisher. But subjectively, I think it looks worse than the previous games, due to some key changes in the system itself. My favorite part of the combat in the first four AC games is how uniquely grounded it was. Your character would always move slowly in a guarded stance, and oftentimes your blade wouldn't touch the enemy's flesh until you killed them. AC3 removes that artistic direction. Now, instead of clashing blades, you stab the enemy a dozen times until they die, which to me feels a lot more generic. This is still a paired animation system, not a hitbox system, so this was an artistic choice, not one made out of necessity. On top of that, the stances you and your enemies have in combat look way wackier than before, with everyone frantically shuffling around the battlefield in ways that look a lot more awkward than the Ezio trilogy. The counter kill the series was famous for used to be a fluid animation. The enemy attacks, and you counter without missing a beat. In AC3, countering causes everything to go into slow motion so you can choose your next move, and I struggle to see the point of this change. It doesn't look good to be constantly going into slow-mo, but once you understand the system, you're pressing the button fast enough that you rarely are anyway. Instead, the game just doesn't keep up animation-wise, so your character just sort of waves their hand near the attacker's weapon and goes right into the kill animation instead of the deeply satisfying counters that we used to have. And while I'm not looking for difficulty in these games, it stands that it was somewhat skill-based to pull off a timed counter in the Ezio trilogy, while the counter window in AC3 gives you time to take a sip of coffee before making any decisions. In fact, there are a couple instances of AC3 removing the timing and reflexes component of combat entirely. I just mentioned how the counter window was increased several times over, but another core aspect of the old combat system was the rhythm component. It used to be that if you pressed attack right as your previous attack landed, the last attack of your combo would instantly kill your enemy. This does not exist at all in AC3 because all completed combos instantly kill your enemy. So while AC1 through Revelations discouraged button mashing, that is legitimately the best course of action here. This reliance on instant kill mechanics takes away from the depth quite a bit, even if the other games also use them a lot. Up until I made this video, I actually thought enemies didn't have health, and that the only thing that mattered was completing a combo to trigger a finisher animation. I know now that isn't actually true. If you hit a regular about a dozen times, they will die. It took me 12 years to learn that, because it is legitimately hard to keep an enemy alive that long. All enemies, even the elite ones, are built so that you can kill them within a couple seconds. For example, let's take a look at the Janissaries from AC Revelations. These guys were by no means difficult, but they were one of the hardest enemies in the Ezio trilogy. 
They could counter most attacks, they would shoot you often, and even a perfect counter or chain attack would only damage them. But in AC3, you do not have attacks that can do a chunk of the enemy's health. You are either trying to complete an instant kill combo, or you're doing a single tick of damage. There is no in-between. That is why even the Jaegers, the closest parallel AC3 has to the Janissaries, die in 2-6 to six button presses pretty much every time. Combat is exclusively about memorizing which combos instantly kill which archetypes, and once you memorize that, there is no further challenge the game has to offer. Again, I don't need these games to be hard, but having players adapt to new escalating scenarios is cool. In AC3, the combat never evolves at all. The archetypes you meet in Chapter 2 are the same ones you will meet in Chapter 12, and your arsenal barely changes as you go. You don't increase your health, not that you would need to, you don't face enemies with new attack patterns, and you don't ever learn any new moves. Combat is static from beginning to end. And don't get me started on the boss fights. Kiting your enemy around to barrels so that incredibly ugly animations can play, plus dealing with a camera that swings around sporadically because it isn't used to being anchored on a one-on-one -on -one fight, these are a joke every time they pop up. Another huge change that makes absolutely no sense to me was the removal of a lock-on system. Once again, the devs marketed this as a positive change, saying they got rid of a clunky mechanic, but the game is exclusively worse for it, and on top of that, Hardlock wouldn't come back for a long time, so this had lasting effects on the series. In the past, you pressed lock on, and this put you into a combat stance. If you wanted to leave combat, you would unlock. This allowed some strategies, like stunning an enemy so you could unlock and assassinate them from behind. Now, this is automated. The game decides if you should be in combat or not, and it does a bad job. I can't tell you how many times I came up on guards who were waiting for me to sprint by them, but I couldn't physically attack them until they themselves got into a combat stance, so I just had to wait or let them push me over. Now I know I'm getting real in-depth here, but I want to make an important distinction. Most people do not play in a way where any of this matters. I mean the boss fights suck no matter what, but ask a majority of people and I bet they will say they played Brotherhood and AC3 the exact same way. Counter, then chain kill everyone. If that's all you want, that's still what you get. But I often bring up White Light's discussion of extrinsic versus intrinsic motivation in his videos. The Ezio trilogy almost never gives you any extrinsic motivation to do anything other than counter and chain kill. But the fact that I could throw sand, dodge, or throw enemies into a merchant stall was really cool intrinsically. Choosing whether to grab an enemy and headbutt them, punch them, or kick them was functionally redundant. They all do the same thing but having the options was cool. And so while 90% of this combat is exactly the same, to the point that most people play it the same way, the fact that it took out the little things that kept me intrinsically motivated to look cool outside of repeating the same, admittedly really well done canned finisher animations over and over, is a shame. They could have given us these amazing animations without lowering the skill ceiling to the ground and taking away things like grab, rhythm combo kills, and sidestep dodging. And that's by no means to say I think they should have left it as it was, because I think the combat needed to evolve, but none of the criticisms levied at past games were really improved. In fact, most of them actively got worse. I end up stuck on the same basic issue I had with the parkour. Why did Ubisoft go through so much effort just to needlessly make something less good than it already was? Stealth is a category this series struggled with from the very beginning, with barebones mechanics propped up by some novel social stealth ideas and world design that made good use of your mobility. There aren't a ton of changes made to the system here other than one big addition that would go on to influence the direction of the series quite a bit in the future, hiding in bushes. In the past, your character was pretty useless at the ground level, without a lot of options other than standing upright and hiding behind things. Adding in these zones where you could become invisible gave the player a lot more options to stay hidden without having to find the high ground. These stalking zones, in combination with the new ability to whistle and the soft cover system, made traditional stealth much more viable than it used to be. There are some big improvements made specifically to the remaster that make it a much smoother experience than the original version. You can free aim much more reliably, although still not at the level you can in Black Flag. You couldn't whistle from the bushes before, which was really frustrating. And bafflingly, you couldn't do a low-profile double assassination before, which makes no sense at all. So yeah, stealth is way better in the remaster. A cool addition that is pretty much just visual is the fact that you can actually assassinate with any weapon. You can jump off a building and air assassinate with your tomahawk or sword instead of just the hidden blade. 
that doesn't really change anything mechanically, but running up to a guard, ramming your bayonet into their stomach, and shooting the guard behind them is an awesomely over-the-top double assassination method. Not only this, but there is also a newfound focus on momentum in assassinations. The player character has more speed and power when running, and assassinations now carry that momentum over. This means you can go from target to target without missing a beat, which provides a whole new type of predatory power fantasy that the franchise hadn't really explored before, and really never did again. However, like I said, stealth suffers from needless regressions just like the rest of the game. The decision to remove lock-on, which once again the devs praised as a good decision, takes a lot of control away from the player. Every time you play an AC game and you're looking right at an enemy below you, only for your character to air assassinate someone else entirely, you can go ahead and blame AC3 for that, because this is the game that removed the target lock. But the problem that sits above everything else is that the detection system just isn't great. It's not as bad as Unity or Valhalla, and you can certainly get through a lot of the forts in the game stealthily, but it isn't uncommon to be instantly detected without warning, and for every enemy in the fort to know exactly where you are. This gets kind of funny when you get caught in the city, because it's like the guards put out an 18th century APB on you and every alleyway gets a checkpoint set up. I get why they did this, they didn't want you to just run two blocks and escape, like in the Ezio trilogy, they wanted to go back to the tense chase and hide mechanics of AC1. But with the combat as easy as it was, I did tend to just butcher anyone who saw me. I've said in the past that detection systems can make or break stealth, and here I think it does a lot of harm. I just didn't have as much fun as previous games due to the inconsistent mechanics and the poor balance of stealth and combat. However, while that may be my main issue, there are some big design choices that lead to stealth being deprioritized over older games. The most prominent is that this newfound focus on ground level stealth takes focus away from design that allows for social blending and parkour to get above enemies. In terms of social stealth, there just straight up aren't many opportunities for it at all. The main times I used it were in tailing missions and a couple rare story missions, but otherwise there just aren't a lot of chances to use it. In fact, there isn't a single assassination in the main story that lets you use social stealth to get to your target. In terms of getting above your opponents, like in the older games, the flatter world design stifles that option a lot. The primary place you can utilize stealth in this game is in the forts, where you have very few options to get up high and scope out your surroundings. Sneaking around in the grass just doesn't fulfill the same fantasy, and again, doesn't play to the franchise's strengths. Also, if a guard gets suspicious of your character, you will stand up straight and not hide again until you break line of sight. So in a game with no crouch and no real way to hide other than ducking into the grass, you have a lot of situations where your character is just standing still with nowhere to go as a guard walks toward them. This doesn't happen in AC4, where suspicion is actually a great way to trick enemies into coming toward you while you duck back down and take a more advantageous position. In fact, a lot of these problems in general were addressed in AC4, which again, uses a lot of the same systems. The plantations may not offer a lot more mobility options than these forts, but the combination of better enemy AI, more challenging guard placement, better tools and ranged options, harder obstacles like guard towers and lantern users, better level design, and a much more functional detection system make it the difference between a system I don't like, and arguably one of the best of the old school style. You can tell stealth just wasn't a big focus for the team here, especially when you look at the main story. In fact, of all the main targets you kill, only the first two even give you the option to get to them stealthily at all. Every target after John Pitcairn is killed in some form of scripted sequence, with very few big stealth sections to speak of in the entire game. I don't find the stealth as offensive as the combat, but it simply isn't very good, and seems to take a back seat in favor of being able to mindlessly tear down your enemies with no danger or challenge at all. In the past I've said that a good story can save a subpar game for me. Unfortunately, of all the criticisms I have of AC3, the narrative issues are what disappointed me the most. There are three aspects of the story I want to focus on here. The pacing, the implementation of the American Revolution setting, and the handling of the Assassin Templar conflict. Starting with pacing, I have criticized games like Unity and Revelations for padding out their story missions, but AC3 is not that kind of beast. There is a ton of meat on its bones, and each sequence gets more than enough time to breathe. Unfortunately, I don't think it uses that time well. The game is infamous for its pacing issues, most notably the extended prologue where you play as Haytham Kenway, father of Radun Hagedu. Since we are in the story section, I will now go ahead and acknowledge the fact that I will refer to the main character of the game as Radun Hagedu, as opposed to Connor, the name he was given out of necessity to fit in. There are two pronunciations for his name in-game, one from his voice actor, Radun Hagedu, my name is Rado Hangado. 
Radohan Kedong. A strong name. You should use it. And one from everybody else. Radun Hagedung. Radun Hagedung. Radun Hagedung. Radun Hagedung. I am going with the option more of the actors went with, and it is simply my personal preference to go with his real name. In any case, before we get to him, we have to go through his father's story first. When all is said and done, you go through a full quarter of this game before even meeting the main protagonist. Now, personally, I don't mind a long prologue so long as that length is narratively justified, but in my opinion, it is not. The best indicator to me that this prologue is too long is not how many hours it takes to finish, but instead how many story arcs they pack into it. Haytham has three isolated conflicts with their own villains and climactic moments. First, we have a prolonged voyage from England to Boston, during which Haytham is charged with uncovering a plot to mutiny. Then the story sees Haytham gathering up local contacts and planning a raid on a fort run by a slaver. And finally, we see him forge a bond with a woman named Tio and team up with her to attack a redcoat expedition. These are a lot of different plot points to set up and resolve in a prologue. And some of it is kind of redundant. I mean, both the second and third chapters of Haytham's story end with him and his allies dressing up as redcoats to mount a surprise attack on a military unit. That really didn't need to happen twice. This game has a bad habit of recycling the same plot points over and over again, and that will be brought up more. I get why the story lingers on Haytham. The twist, of course, is that he and his allies are actually Templars, and connecting with them feeds into the moral ambiguity the narrative tries to center itself around. However, I don't think it accomplishes this well. There is so much going on that each Templar you meet gets one quick intro mission before fading into the background. Aside from Haytham and maybe Charles Lee, I don't think any of these characters are more fleshed out than targets from previous games despite all the extra time you spend with them, given that they are sharing space with a theater assassination, the journey to the New World, two large-scale military raids, and a love story, all just in the prologue. I understand the value of each of these plot points individually, but the term kill your darlings exists for a reason. Even valuable plot points can get in the way of the overall story you are trying to tell. And this isn't even the end of the prologue. Once you finally do get control over Dun Hagedung, it is another two sequences before he becomes an assassin. After the death of his mother, seemingly at the hands of Charles Lee, he is given visions of his people falling to ruin if he does not intervene, and so he seeks out the former mentor of the Assassin Brotherhood, Achilles, to help him kill all the Templars. You finally don the robes in chapter 6 out of 12, and this drawn-out intro is partly to blame for why our main character was so polarizing. Opinions on Radun Hagedung have been kinder in the years since release, but there is still this persisting opinion that he is bland, boring, and whiny. Now, I appreciate the character, but I understand these criticisms. You see a lot of people online claiming that those who have a problem with him just wished he was funny and charismatic like Ezio, but the deeply damaged man who never smiles and has a monotone, stilted way of speaking is a wildly popular archetype. Instead, while they are very different characters, the complaints here remind me more of those pointed at the portrayal of Anakin Skywalker in Star Wars. The prequel films spend a lot of time focusing on this character's goofy dialogue and childish temper tantrums, choosing to skip over the actions that led him to be looked up to as a warrior and friend. I use him as an example because when the Clone Wars TV show was released, he was still moody, quick to temper, and sometimes annoying, but the story gave him time to showcase courage, intelligence, and compassion to make him believable as a general and role model without shedding his flaws. Radun Hagedung is also a tale of two characters. If you just play the main game, he will seem more stupid than idealistic, more rude than stoic, and overall misguided in motivation. In some scenes, it feels like he's supposed to come off as intimidating, and instead reminds me more of the toddler from this old Key and Peele skit. Why can't I have mama's milk? It's a simple request. He never drops the demeanor of a rageful teenager, despite being nearly 30 by the end of the game, and while I appreciate the idea of a man whose behavior is informed by trauma and cultural differences, the childishness of his dialogue sometimes feels unintentionally overdone. The thing is, he does have that balance where we get to see his flaws weighed against strengths, but none of that happens in the main story itself. Instead, he gets this in side content, specifically the Homestead and Assassin Recruit missions. The Homestead missions see you finding wayward souls in need of a home and hosting them on your land. By the end of the game, you have a flourishing town where families are started, romances are kindled, and the townspeople fight to keep each other safe. Redun Hagedung even walks a woman down the aisle. He matters to these people, and while he is still very much the same naive young man he is in the main story, he gets to be more than a dumb kid with too much strength. Likewise, the assassin recruit missions hold a lot more weight here than they do in past games. Redun Hagedung is the only assassin in the colonies at the start of the game, and he tasks himself with rebuilding the Brotherhood. 
With Achilles staying back at the homestead, Radun Hagedun practically acts as mentor himself, showcasing leadership abilities that the main game does not portray very well. The naval missions, also optional, showcase this leadership too. I love hiding good character building in side content, but almost all of the main character's best moments come from outside the main story. And it goes beyond that. This side content impacts that story in ways that make it really weird if you don't play it all. The entire conclusion to Radun Hagedun's art with Achilles only happens if you do all the homestead missions. Otherwise, he is this game's most consistent side character right up until he's suddenly gone from the story. And the fact that you can go through the whole game without building the assassins back up is so weird, especially since these assassins show up no matter what to save you in sequence 8, and at the end of the game, Charles Lee threatens to destroy your merry band of assassins, which for some players, won't even exist. The creative director himself stated he wished that the homestead missions were better integrated into the game, and also that the prologue was better handled. And that's not even bringing up actual cut content, like Radun Hagedun's final speech that provides probably the best overview of what his character is all about, but isn't even in the game. It has been hard at times, but never harder than today. To see all I worked for, perverted, discarded, forgotten. As much as I like Haytham and the interesting themes this game attempts to take on, choosing to keep a five-sequence prologue while relegating the main character's best personal qualities to side content or cutting them entirely hurts the overall story. However, the pacing isn't the only reason Radun Hagedun gets so much criticism, and now we will take a look at how he's portrayed in the seven sequences where he actually gets to be an assassin. Once the prologue is over, AC3 finds itself trying to balance the same two components as every other AC game, the historical setting and its own Assassin Templar lore. I will talk about both separately, starting with the historical side, because one big difference between this game and other entries is that the entire plot revolves around the historical events it portrays. Where other games are character-driven stories that use setting as a backdrop, AC3 takes a forced gump approach giving players a breakneck run-through of all the most well-known characters and events of the American Revolution. While a game like AC4 chose historical figures that could carry their own story arcs, AC3 has a large cast of characters who pop up so history nerds can go, oh wow, that's James Barrett, and then they're gone as fast as they came. Sam Adams gets the best of it, and even he only lasts a few chapters, and then you have a character like Lafayette, who you see for the first time all the way in Chapter 10, and then in his second of only three appearances, he is already one of Radun Hagedun's greatest allies, despite him being introduced like 10 minutes ago. The game assumes its audience is already familiar with the American Revolution, and that they will be invested in events and figures based on recognition alone, without having to write them in a way that is narratively valuable. Where other AC games weave the main character in and out of real historical events, making them a background witness and occasional contributor, AC3 gives its protagonist a much more hands-on role. Radun Hagedun was present for the Boston Massacre, which was caused by his own father. He personally threw tea in the harbor at the Boston Tea Party. He was the one actually riding the horse during the midnight ride, and Paul Revere was just on the back. He essentially presses back the British at Lexington and Concord. He personally saves the day at Bunker Hill, Monmouth, and the Battle of Chesapeake Bay. And he was present just out of painting frame at the signing of the Declaration of Independence. Within the lore of the game, he did not just experience these events he essentially decided the outcome of the revolution. A lot of the game feels like it is just about the revolution and the Assassin Templar stuff was shoehorned in after the fact. He starts every chapter by going after a target, but always somehow ends up commanding troops, or sitting on the Continental Congress, or doing any variety of things that are only tenuously tied to his original goal. One of the biggest issues with this romanticized version of the revolution is that it clashes with the game's parallel desire to avoid the usual one-sided portrayal of the conflict. This disconnect was clear before the game even came out, with big TV spots marketing this as a full-on epic about freedom from British tyranny, to the point of it being borderline comedic. When I decide, it will be them, not us. Okay. Well, I want to give credit where it is due. The actual game is far more nuanced than the marketing implied. It touches on issues that American media rarely does, like the military and political faults of George Washington and slavery's role in building the nation. But it is hard to show other perspectives of a conflict when your narrative rarely extends itself beyond the events you could find in a child's history textbook. My issue here was well articulated in a paper by Professor Adrian Shaw of Temple University, 
where it is discussed that as much as the game wants to critique colonial powers, it limits itself to a lens that its assumed audience would be familiar with. There are many instances where the game tells you that you should consider the British perspective, but it never sees you ally with or even sympathize with any Redcoat characters to hear that perspective. Likewise, while the game totally deserves credit for its hiring of consultants and actors to portray the Ganyang Kahaga, they don't really factor into the moment-to-moment -moment story much after the intro. The game claims to give the players the quote-unquote native perspective, but I find it really weird that with all the throwaway historical figures who show up once and barely even get one line, if any, none of these historical figures were indigenous. We never actually see that perspective outside of the fictional characters this game creates. A lot of this was represented by how the game covers the Sullivan Expedition, a campaign ordered by George Washington that saw over 40 Iroquois villages raised. The fact that AC3 touches on this at all deserves some credit, but the watered-down portrayal here undermines that. While it is a tragic and important plot point that sees Radun Hagedung's faith in the Patriots shattered, all we see is half a dozen deaths under the shadow of the 5,000 Iroquois people who were actually displaced historically. In the narrative, the tragedy here comes from the fact that Radun Hagedung is pulled into conflict with his childhood best friend, Ganondogon. This character is the only actual attempt at a realistic representation of the Mohawk position in the war, in that they sided with the Loyalists to protect their land from colonists for the most part. But to have the entirety of that conflict condensed into these two fictional characters, one of whom is influenced heavily by the colonists, the other tricked and influenced by the main villain, simplifies and portrays it as if the Ganyangahaga had no agency in the war, which could not have been further from the truth. I find myself thinking of an historical figure like Thyandonesia, also known as Joseph Brandt, who led members of the Mohawk people and loyalists against the colonists. And I know it might seem weird to cherry-pick one historical figure, but when you look at his life it's almost weirder that he's not in the game. He was a Mohawk leader who was prominent enough to have met George Washington and King George III, and was even brother-in-law of William Johnson, a primary target. If you look up Ganyangahaga, a picture of Thyandonesia pops up. More important than all that, it was his campaigns mixed with outright propaganda that were partly used to justify the Sullivan expedition. The game presents the conflict between Radun Hagedung's people and the colonists as a shocking revelation because that allows the story to make sense. The only way his blind loyalty to the colonists works is if the actual Ganyangahaga perspective is as erased as it is in most textbooks, and he never gets the chance to interact with it. In reality, figures like Thyandonesia would have been active for years, and it is hard to imagine a man like Radun Hagedung, who sat at the Continental Congress, would have been insulated from that conflict. Even though the story makes it clear that Radun Hagedung's village is isolated from the other Ganyangahaga, it is still deliberately creating this weird dynamic where the main character's actions directly oppose the historical plight of his people, and it is unfortunate that the game's main way of acknowledging that incongruity is to just bring it up as rarely as possible. It is easy to see why one might be frustrated at Ubisoft's exclusion of characters like Thyandonesia, who could have easily represented a unique and often ignored indigenous perspective, in favor of Paul Revere yelling at you for 10 minutes, because that was a more recognizable event. To the left, Connor! Now you can go hours discussing the history and philosophy of this game. One cool thing I found was this Reddit post by user Llama 4 from a few years ago, providing both a subjective review of AC3 as well as a rundown of historical inaccuracies that I thought was well done. But within the limited scope of this video, I wanted to express the opinion that as admirable as it is that AC3 wanted to subvert the usual portrayals of the Revolutionary War, it finds itself constantly limited by its childlike representation of actual history. Even when our main character watches as the nation he helped build forces out his people and leans on the institution of slavery, it falls flat, because the events leading up to this failed to meaningfully portray the historical weight that was actually at play here. As much space as the revolution takes, the story still boils down to a hooded man with a list of people to kill, same as every other AC game. It is clear from the get-go that the goal was to make the Assassin Templar conflict more morally ambiguous than the Ezio trilogy. I love Ezio's games, but the villains were definitely cookie-cutter evildoers. AC1 had its issues, but it excelled at having Altair's morality challenged in the face of intelligent, sometimes even earnest, adversaries. AC3 tries to do the same, with the prologue and long confession scenes to flesh out the targets, but it just doesn't live up to the original for me. Take a couple examples. In AC1, we see a target publicly break a man's knees, a horrific act of cold violence. 
And yet inside the clinic, we see he legitimately cares about saving his patients. You truly believe you were helping them? It's not what I believe. It's what I know. Later, we see human beings in cages, an abominable act, but the Templars justify it because they believe they were saving outcasts who would have otherwise been shunned from society. Beggars, whores, addicts, lepers, do they strike you as proper slaves? Unfit for even the most menial tasks? No, I took them not to sell, but to save. Now these targets were cruel slavers and murderers, but while the cost was too high, we clearly see why they believed in the righteousness of their causes, and Altair's own morality is clearly left shaken by some of these encounters. Let's compare that to the first two targets of AC3. William Johnson attempts to buy the land upon which Radunagadung's village sits, and when those who live there push back, he threatens to kill them. As he dies, he claims you did a bad thing because he was just trying to protect the land, something the game very much does not show us. You speak of salvation, but you were killing them. Aye. Likewise, take John Pitcairn. The first thing he says when you assassinate him is, Why? Why did you do this? And Excuse me? You are a commanding officer in a battle where, historically, 1,500 people died, and your response to being stabbed is confused shock? What kind of writing is that? And then he says he never wanted to kill the Patriot leaders, he just wanted to parlay. It was all a misunderstanding. But this is two months after Lexington and Concord when the conflicts began. Thousands had died by this point, and Pitcairn had been commanding troops the whole time. Hard to see how requesting parlay with Sam Adams was something he just didn't get to yet. So that's the first big problem the targets of AC3 share. Their moral arguments are legless because we never see the benefits of their actions, only vague promises of things they would have done juxtaposed against generic violence. We are told the Templars have a point, but never shown it. They could have shown us villages that were kept safe by Johnson's control of the land instead of just showing him threatening to kill people. We could have seen Pitcairn make some attempt at peace since Lexington and Concord, and instead we see him shell a city. This also ties back into frustrations with Radun Hagedung as a character. How do you make an antagonist seem justified if you don't give them a compelling argument? Well, you can make the protagonist an idiot. The targets give flimsy, easy to counterpoints, but Radun Hagedung never manages anything more than a dumb line like, no, all should be free. We start seeing this pattern, wherein instead of these confession scenes being debates between two parties where both have a case for being right, like AC1, we instead have one person making claims to a main character who appears unable to even fully understand them. Again, it would be one thing if he were just an idiot and that was his whole character, but he's not. He has plenty of moments where he is able to put together cohesive arguments. Early on, in a discussion with Sam Adams, he confidently and succinctly pushes back against the idea that the plight of the revolutionaries was as unjust as that of the slaves in the colonies. In these conversations, he is still idealistic and maybe even naive, but he is not unintelligent. And yet when the writers want to create this illusion of moral ambiguity, they dumb him down hard. While AC1 gave us interesting back-and-forth debates, the memory corridors of AC3 are more akin to lectures. Every single target spends more time calling Radun Hagedun an idiot than actually trying to justify their own actions. Church is especially egregious, because he essentially just looks at the camera and says, Have you heard of moral ambiguity before? It's all a matter of perspective. There is no single path through life that's right and fair and does no harm. You don't get more tell-don't-show than having a character do nothing but explain what moral ambiguity is instead of actually showing morally ambiguous actions. This is the somewhat frustrating cycle we find ourselves in for the four sequences between the prologue and the last chunk of the game. Again, it's not well paced, but anyhow, the narrative does take a turn when Radun Hagedun actually meets his own father. Haytham is easily the most interesting Templar in the game. It is his amazing portrayal by actor Adrian Huff that really sells him because he gets you caught on every word he says, almost leading me to trust him just on charisma alone. His belief that true freedom is an impossibility in the face of human corruption is nothing novel, but he just sounds so good when he says it, so who am I to argue? Unfortunately, as charismatic as he is, he falls into the same trap as the other Templars. He lectures Radun Hagedun endlessly on why his beliefs are misguided, but offers no concrete plans to make the world better other than putting himself in charge. While people point to this scene on the roof as one of the best in the series, his main point ends up being that the colonists will never actually fight for freedom for all or protect Radun Hagedun's people, as other Templars have already said. 
He dresses up his words nicely, but a lot of the stuff he talks about is stuff that we've already heard ad nauseum. Haytham is also a great example of this game's childish approach to morality. When you play as him in the prologue, the game shows you he is a good man because he frees slaves and saves lives. When the game needs you to see him as a villain, that heroism is gone. He has four missions in the later half of the game where Radun Hagedun tries to ally with him, father and son. In three of the four missions, there is a scene where the two are interrogating someone and Haytham kills them in cold blood once he has what he needs. The same thing happens three times in a row to show you that he's a bad guy, and Radun Hagedun is shocked every time. In fact, this exact same thing even pops up in AC Rogue, and at a point, I think the audience gets it. Not only does this abjectly fail to portray moral ambiguity, but it is also another example of Ubisoft repeating the same points over and over again. AC1 showed Assassins and Templars both doing good and bad things, but AC3 can't seem to comprehend that kind of nuance. Again, another reason why the long prologue feels wasted. It could have given us the Templar perspective and showed us its efficacy, but landed instead on generic heroism. His introduction is also where Radun Hagedun's motivations start getting really confusing. At this point in the story, he seems to think that the main barrier between him and Haytham working together is Lee, but it's hard to understand why he has this vendetta when Lee was always just an underling of Haytham. It is made clear that Radun Hagedun fully believes it was Haytham's order that got his mother killed, and if he thinks the catalyst for his mother's death and the burning of his village was Haytham's doing, why is he so obsessed with Lee? Motivations get even weirder when it is disclosed that it was not Haytham or even Lee who ordered the burning of Radun Hagedun's village, but George Washington himself all those years ago. The most baffling part by far is that Radun Hagedun doesn't seem to mind this revelation that much. I mean, his relationship with Washington isn't mended, but they still meet many times and even canonically play a round of bocce ball together. Yet Radun Hagedun is still obsessed with killing Lee. Why? Washington is the true threat to his people, Haytham the true threat to his philosophy. At this point in the story, what did Lee do? He got lost in the forest, got racist, and left. Again, it ties back to poor writing decisions making Radun Hagedun hard to connect with. He eventually abandons his attempt at unity with the Templars, but is still going after Lee, not Haytham, who again, tells Lee what to do, and he tracks them both to Fort George. For whatever reason, his master plan that he made a whole toy model for is to just blow himself up. Again, the main story does not do his intellect any favors. He has a ship blast the fort while he is in firing range, and gets severely injured frame one. Lee just leaves, he's fine, and Radun Hagedun is left fighting Haytham, who is also fine, so only he was actually injured by his own cannon fire. I get that it cleared out the other guards, but it is a stupid setup that leads to an absolutely horrible boss where the camera swings around and you throw Haytham into barrels three times. He actually has a really cool speech here, but it's a three minute speech and the fight takes 30 seconds, so almost no one ever hears it. It ends when he has his son dead to rights, one hand on his throat, one on the hidden blade to keep it away. The only way Radun Hagedun survives is if he can get his hand free, and oh hey, Atham just forgot about the blade and let you stab him. That's cool. Now I want to be fair here. If you read the book, Forsaken, Haytham is actually a much more complete character and his feelings about his son are fleshed out a lot. With the context of that story, you could easily argue Haytham let Radun Hagedun stab him. Do I think the brief moments we get with him in the actual game support this? Heck no. But hey, if you emotionally connect with that as the canon answer, all power to you. And you know what? I like his death scene. He doesn't show cliche remorse, he stays true to his beliefs and dies on that hill. But speaking of his beliefs, remember when I said Haytham had no concrete goals for the country? I actually lied, because he had one, and only one, very specific goal. Get Charles Lee promoted to commander-in-chief. This singular goal absolutely compromises any and all philosophical points Haytham attempted to make throughout the game. When Haytham dies, Lee is left in control of the Templar Order, and at this point, all pretense of moral ambiguity goes out the window. Lee is a Sunday morning cartoon who wants to kill all who oppose him and make Radun Hagedun watch. The fact that he is shown exclusively as a sadistic bigot with no positive traits tramples the limited moral arguments the other Templars thought up. Johnson claims to want to protect the land, but Lee calls Radun Hagedun's people human refuse that he will dispose of. Pitcairn wanted diplomacy, and yet Lee says he will roast the heads of the Founding Fathers. 
So the only two times Templars actually had plans they thought might help people, it is later determined that the man who would be in charge had other plans anyways. It also undermines Haytham entirely. For all his spouting about equality and peace, the only plan he actually has is to give a cruel, unhinged man control of an entire country. It really dampens every cool scene we saw between Radun Hagedun and Haytham when we realize that the main moral conflict was between this guy, whose naivete borders on actual delusion, and this guy, whose cure for war and racism is to put the racist murderer in charge. Radun Hagedun spends the finale tracking down Lee, where most of these memes come from. There is this weird moment where he just walks up and gets captured for no reason, I guess to show dominance, which puts him in a sticky situation. How's he gonna get out of this one? Well, that was easy. This culminates in a chase where our main character is impaled on the ground. Lee is home free, except, hey, he wants to monologue and walks up to Radun Hagedun, who is still fully armed. That's cool. Then he dies in a cutscene. While I think this final scene is really cool, Charles Lee did very little to deserve it. Even the final quote he gives Radun Hagedun before he gets blasted is just another iteration of the same idea we've already heard. He doesn't really challenge his enemy's ideology, just brags about the longevity of his own. And that's kind of the game. It is a tragic ending to be sure with Radun Hagedun having lost everything he hoped to preserve, betrayed by the few people he trusted. But while so much of this story looks good on paper, it just doesn't come together. As much praise as the handling of grey morality in this game gets online, I think the portrayal is downright childish in comparison to AC1. It really does try to dig deeper than the Ezio trilogy, and I think it deserves credit for that, but the writing and dialogue collapse under the weight of themes this game simply wasn't ready for. Except that's not the whole game. In all my other reviews, I don't even bother talking about the modern day plot because it always sucks. Is it good in AC3? No. But it was at least supposed to matter. Quality aside, the series was working toward a definitive climax, and AC3 was supposed to make Desmond's entire story worth it. But after 2009, things had changed for the franchise. Instead of a three-game story arc, AC3 was now capping off a five-game story arc. This means that the story up to AC3 wasn't fully written until two years after AC2's 2009 launch, which is when planning for AC3 would have begun if Brotherhood wasn't developed first. All of this was under the umbrella of series creator Patrice Desilet, leaving Ubisoft during the development of Brotherhood and taking his ideas for the series with him. The other games were all about Desmond training to wage war on the Templars and save the world. So now that he was ready in both mind and body, how does AC3 pay off everything he had gone through since 2007? He goes on a scavenger hunt for three magical batteries that can open a magical door to access something that may or may not save the world from annihilation. Yes, the climax of the whole franchise to this point is a MacGuffin quest. I know people have a lot of issues with the ending, a sentiment that I do share, and I'll talk about that, but the part that let me down the most was the handling of established characters. Now to be fair, Ubisoft had revelations to a lot of the butchery already. Lucy Stillman's death was given the most unsatisfying explanation possible in a weird first-person platforming DLC no one liked, and Subject 16, the enigmatic character who supposedly had all the answers since AC1, dissolves without ever acknowledging the weird Eve Sun plot that was clearly going to be the original modern day AC3. That just leaves Desmond and Vidic as the final stalwarts of the original game's narrative, but I won't start with either of them. Instead, I'm going to start with a lesser known character who was very easily identifiable to hardcore AC fans back then, Daniel Cross. In case you didn't know, Cross is the modern-day protagonist of the graphic novels featuring Russian assassin Nikolai Orlov. Beyond just having important ancestors, Cross himself was the sleeper agent who was programmed to kill the assassin mentor, shattering the modern brotherhood. Very important to AC lore in a time when the series was only still a few games young. You would not know that, though, from his portrayal in AC3. Here he is a common thug who is used to showcase to the player that Desmond has become a skilled assassin and combatant by making an example of Cross every time they meet. Again, same plot points over and over. Desmond only gets three missions, and in literally every one, he meets Daniel Cross and drops him like he's nothing. In a modern day story that is so light on interesting narrative beats, maybe they could have just limited this to one time and used the extra space there for more interesting things. 
Instead, we take a character who is integral to the lore of this franchise, and we use him as a low-rate Bond henchman who might as well be comic relief that you forget right after he died. But at the end of the day, Cross was just a graphic novel character. How does Vidic do in this story? Well, near the end of the game, Desmond's father is kidnapped, taking him right back to where it all started, Abstergo Industries. As you murder your way through the guards, showing just how much Desmond has grown since AC2, Vidic spouts a bunch of insults at you and talks about how the Templars intend to make the world better and how Desmond is just ruining everything. Immediately, before we even see his face, he seems so much less interesting than the man we knew in AC1. There's no true change to be had without comprehensive, systemic intervention. Chemo for the masses. Education. Re-education, to be more precise. His challenging and introspective dialogue with Desmond is replaced with generic evil ramblings that talk about the idea of peace and order without pointing to any of the things the Templars actually do to help people. Does that sound familiar to you? Enrich life here! We save and transform them! Then you finally meet him, and oh yeah, Desmond has the apple. You know, the device Altair used to wipe out entire Mongol hordes. Vidic just lets Desmond into his office with a weapon of mass destruction, and Desmond kills him, because how else was that possibly going to go? And yeah, that's it for Vidic, after five years, thrown away like an idiot to die with a minute of screen time. So let's reflect for a moment. All three main villains in this game are killed by a clearly visible weapon they just forgot about. Want to wave away Haytham's case because of the book? Fine. But that does not excuse the absolutely atrocious lack of creativity on display here for having it happen three times. How many times have we talked about the writers just using the same ideas over and over again? Some parts of this story are so bad that I can't believe they made it into a first draft, let alone a full game. Anyhow, that leaves one remaining character from AC1, Desmond himself. After they find all the puzzle pieces, they open the door, and wow! A device that'll just save the world. That was easy. Only thing is Desmond needs to die for it to work, and so in a textbook example of deus ex machina, two gods, Juno and Minerva, ones who came before I should say, show up out of nowhere and start having a debate in front of Desmond. Minerva tells him to let the world die so he can be the savior of what remains, a world free of Juno's influence. Juno counters by giving him an honestly cool vision of how even if he does this, his words will eventually be twisted by time and human nature will bow itself right back to where it was. There are some cool ideas here, and in fact, to an extent, I think this brief sequence does a better job of portraying this game's specific version of the assassin philosophy than the main game does. To know that human nature will always lead to the twisting of faith and culture for power, and to fight a losing battle in the name of freedom all the same. Although the fact that this one clip handles that idea better than anything in the main game probably says more about the main game than anything else. But in spite of any interesting attempts at handling these themes, it stands that they come in the final few minutes of a thrown together scavenger hunt, hardly the setup for a worthy conclusion for a long running character. Desmond makes the choice that doesn't end the world, dies, and then the game awkwardly cuts to credits. And that is what we waited three years for. To get to the end of AC3 and see how every important character from AC1 was just tossed in the garbage is a real shame. Having two holograms suddenly appear over the solve everything ball just kills everything that was narratively interesting about this dilemma. We could have easily had the same basic themes touched on in ways that were more resonant than Desmond looking for batteries, opening a door, and dying. It honestly hurt as a kid to see this be everything they were able to muster for this conclusion. This story in general, even outside the modern day. Nothing works. I see what they were trying to do, but I watched them stumble at every possible junction, and that was the real reason that AC3 was such a bitter game for me at launch, and to an extent, still is today. This game makes me sad. When you pick it up for fun and turn your brain off, it might be shallow and janky, but there is fun to be had, cool moments to experience, and a world that is definitely worth exploring. But turn your brain on at any capacity, and there isn't a category where it doesn't fall apart. 
All the core gameplay mechanics are watered down and downgraded just for the sake of making them different, and it all ends up being mostly the same as earlier games, just worse. The world is so historically interesting, but the content is incredibly hit or miss to the point that some of it feels genuinely worthless. And all of that would have been okay if it at least told a good story, and it dropped that ball brutally. And of course, as with anything else, my opinion is one of many, and nothing about it is definitive. I think a lot of people find they are able to connect with this story despite its flaws. Take this video I found, for example, that totally shows why a person could truly value Radun Hegedun here. But for me, AC3's narrative is a failed experiment with bad pacing, confused direction, and only a vague idea of what it even wants to be by the end. Stuff just happens without reason, the same story beats are used again and again, and there is this illusion that morally challenging questions are being asked when in reality, nothing here is above an elementary school level. Every aspect of this game leaves me going, that could have been great. And as I said before, there is more consistent fun to be found here than in Valhalla or Unity, so this isn't the worst of the pack in my eyes. But for every moment that was blatantly bad in other games, there was one that shot for the moon and landed right back on its own head in AC3. That vision of what it was aiming for contrasted with the rushed, slapped together reality of the actual final product is why Assassin's Creed 3 remains the most disappointing game that I have ever played. That is all I have for today, and again, that was a lot, and I know AC3 does have its fans. If you are one of them, I really would be happy to chat about it, so long as it is cordial. I make these videos as a hobby, and I like talking about this stuff, especially with people who have different opinions. Thankfully, this review rounds out my big three least favorite AC games, and none of the others come close for me. Obviously, I still have problems with the other entries in this franchise, and I've made it clear that I do not have a lot of faith in Ubisoft as a company, but I am glad to have gotten most of my negatives out of the way. Even through the frustration, this style of game and the fantasy offered just isn't really scratched anywhere else in the industry in my opinion. I know that won't stop people from commenting that I should just stop complaining, which is fair and it is their right, but I did just want to express that all this comes from the perspective of a fan who likes far more of these games than he dislikes, not someone who is just trying to spread anger for the sake of it. Anyhow, um, I do hope you have a great day and that you take care of yourself. <laughs>